Trigger alert. This episode contains content related to child drowning. Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with the Frugal Physician, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. This episode is made possible by medicalexpertwitness.com. Are you a physician looking to take your own profitable medical expert witness practice to the next level? Medicalexpertwitness.com is the ultimate program to learn how to brand yourself as an expert witness and get yourself seen. Sure, building a reputation in the field from scratch has its challenges, but don't let them hold you back. Medicalexpertwitness.com understands what you're facing as they were once there too. In fact, 10 years ago, CEO Dr. Jordan Romano started his own consulting in the medical malpractice space. His experience has included providing expert witness testimony, reviewing medical records, and analyzing complex medical cases. Dr. Romano has become well-versed in the intricacies of medical malpractice law and has worked on cases for both plaintiffs and defendants in nearly every state in the United States. And now his company provides medical professionals with the tools and support they need to supercharge their career as medical expert witnesses. Sounds great, doesn't it? Absolutely. Just imagine having the support you need to brand yourself as a medical expert witness too. Now that's powerful. So what are you waiting for? Visit medicalexpertwitness.com today and gain access to a mentor who can connect you with attorneys in need of your specialized knowledge, expand your network, find new cases, and watch your business thrive. The darkness of dusk was just descending on the pristine waters of the dull lake nestled all the way up in the heights of the towering Himalayan mountains. The hustle and bustle of the day had quit, and peace was starting to emerge in the water surrounded by snow-covered peaks. The shikaras were making their way to their homes on and around the lake, tired after a day of selling their wares and speaking to the many tourists on houseboats on the water. The smell of spices began to float through the air as dinner preparations began on the houseboats. I'm sure I had a very good reason for going on the deck of the houseboat. My parents and I were on summer vacation in the Himalayas. They had opted to stay on terra firma because I was only three years old. But that night, they decided to have dinner on the water with their friends and got caught up in happy conversation just long enough just long enough for them to take eyes off me as I waddled over to the back of the boat to fill up my bag with water. Night was quickly descending, and the water was dark and a little too far away. I knelt, and then I sat down on the stair rung and reached out with the bag. The water was just a little bit too far for me, and plop, all of a sudden, I was in the water. Shock as water entered my nose, shock to realize that I couldn't keep my head above the water. I started flailing, trying to get my head back above the water, yelling whenever I could. Water in my lungs, more flailing, and then quiet. As the surface faded away, I saw the twinkling lights above the water, and then peace. Up on the surface, my parents came out running, and when they heard my voice, they saw their baby in the water and panicked. They jumped in, forgetting that they too could not swim. The boat had drifted and I was too far for them, as my papa desperately clung to the stairs with one hand and tried to grab me with the other. Uncle, my dad's friend, came out and jumped in too, but he too did not know how to swim. Auntie looked at the scene with wide eyes and in her panic looked around. There was a shikara there on the water. She yelled out to him. Shikaras knew how to swim since they spent their entire lives on the water. She asked him to rescue me, and in he jumped. I don't know how he fished me out. It was so dark, but he found me and pulled me to the surface. The next thing I remember is waking up face down, coughing as lake water came out of my mouth and nose. People were pounding on my back. I was alive. The next thing I remember after that is wearing a really large borrowed shirt I had to wear from Auntie for the rest of the night. I was not a fan, 
My other dress was prettier. I laugh remembering how much I hated that shirt at the moment. I owe my life to Auntie and that Shikara roar. Thanks to them, I can be here today to recall that near drowning in the gorgeous lake. And it happens to be my first memory. What blows my mind about this memory is that I had all the tools I needed to save myself. Panic. That's the dangerous thing about drowning. We thrash and thrash and make all the wrong moves. I had my hands and my legs. If I'd just known how to coordinate them, I could have saved myself. People don't generally learn to swim in India, but after this experience, my parents were not taking any more chances. They enrolled all of us in swimming lessons. There, we learned that all that was necessary to save ourselves was to control the panic and apply some instruction on how to move our limbs. And then practice, 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 and we were on our way. In fact, later that year, I was featured in the city paper for being the youngest high diver in the city of over a million people. When I think about how much debt I had as a young attending, I often recall that feeling of drowning. I had two mortgages and over $238,000 in student loans debt, two car payments and two tiny babies, one husband in school, and no pay from my one job when I was on maternity leave. Overall, we had over a million dollars in debt. When the weight of so much debt is on us, it's easy to start thrashing. It's easy to start making the wrong moves, amass credit card debt, take a payday loan or two, and sink even further. This has happened to many families. Luckily, there are a lot of people out there trying to keep us from making those mistakes and putting out good information about personal finance. Thanks to the likes of Dave Ramsey, the White Coat Investor, Chooseify, and others, we were able to climb out from underneath the weight of all this debt in three years by applying a few simple principles. If you too have some debt you'd like to pay off, all you need to do is learn a few facts and a couple of skills, and then practice, practice, practice. You already have all the tools that you need. I'm here to give you the knowledge and facts you need to pay down your debt quickly and efficiently so you can float on into the financial independence sunset happy ending of your dreams. So let's talk about how you get rid of debt in the most efficient manner. Let us consider an example of a physician with the following debts that he'd like to pay off. He has a credit card balance of $50,000, accruing interest at 19%. The monthly payment for that is $2,000. He has two car loans of $10,000 for a Honda and $15,000 for a Toyota at the rate of 5% and 4.5%, respectively. The payment for the Honda is $189 per month and the Toyota is $280 a month. His remaining student loan balance is $250,000 at 6.5% and he is not eligible for public service loan forgiveness. The minimum payment for that in standard repayment is $2,839 a month. He owns a modest home with a mortgage balance of $350,000 and an interest rate of 3.5%. His mortgage payment is $1,571. So he sat down with his wife and they decided they can squeeze out $1,000 a month from their budget to make extra payments towards these loans. So how can he apply that extra $1,000 most effectively? Believe it or not, there's a wrong answer here. Common wisdom might prescribe that he should just take that $1,000, divide it by five for each of his loans, and apply an extra $200 each to every debt every month on top of the minimum payments. Let's call this approach the debt flood. It would take the physician 360 months or 30 years to pay off all his debt if he was just making minimum payments. With debt flood, it would take him 281 months or 23.4 years. And that's if they maintain that $1,000 a month extra savings long enough to make that work. But there are two much more effective methods to apply this extra $1,000 a month to debt payoff. They are named the debt snowball and the debt avalanche. With these methods, using the same amount of extra money, he can pay off his debt in nine years. That's 15 years faster than the debt flood. In both the snowball and the avalanche methods, this physician would continue to make the minimum payments on all his debt, but he would apply that extra $1,000, let's call it his debt hammer, to only one loan at a time. Once that loan is paid off, he would add the monthly payment that he doesn't have anymore because he paid off that debt and add it to his debt hammer and chip away at the next loan he decides to tackle. He would continue to do this until all the loans were paid off. 
The reason applying the debt hammer to one loan at a time works so well is related to the concept of debt amortization. Debt amortization is the schedule of paying off a loan by making regular payments of interest and principal. Principal is the amount you actually borrowed. Because the balance of the loan is highest at the beginning of the loan, the percent interest owed on it is also high. Thus, early on in the life of a loan, the monthly payment contains a higher portion of interest than the later payments. Later in the payoff, a higher percentage of the payment goes towards paying down the principal. But if you make an extra payment, you can tell the lender that you want it all to go to pay down the principal, since you've already made the interest payment you were obligated to pay that month. That way, the whole force of the debt hammer goes towards the principal, and that reduces the interest you pay for the rest of the loan. So hitting one loan at a time with the debt hammer makes faster progress because it hammers down on the principal early and fast in the debt amortization schedule, making the loan accumulate much less interest over its lifespan so the loan gets paid off even faster. So let's talk about the difference between the debt avalanche and the debt snowball. In the avalanche method, he would apply the debt hammer to the highest interest rate loan first. This would be the credit card debt of $50,000 at 19% in our example. With the extra payment, that debt would get wiped out in a little more than two years. Once he celebrates that with his wife, they would apply the original $1,000 plus another $2,000 that they've just freed up in their monthly cash flow to apply $3,000 a month to the next highest interest rate loan, the student loans, at 6.5%. He does have the option of refinancing this down to a lower interest rate, if the rates are favorable, of course, but we'll keep that the same for the sake of this example. The cars would continue to get their minimum payments and would be paid off in five years. When that happens, their payments would also get rolled into the debt avalanche, and his debt hammer would get even more powerful. This physician's six-figure student loans would get paid off in six years. Now his debt hammer has an additional $2839 added to it, and his mortgage gets paid off in the subsequent three or so years. And then he's totally debt-free in nine years. Compare that to the 30 years originally planned by the financial industry and the 23 years he could have spent doing the exact same thing with a debt flood instead of using a debt hammer. So now he has an extra $7,879 a month to invest and buy his financial freedom. And since it only took him nine years, he's much more likely to actually execute this plan without finding a boat or a vacation home to spend the money on instead. The debt snowball also applies all of the debt hammer to one loan at a time. In contrast to the avalanche, the debt snowball applies the hammer to the loan with the smallest balance first, irrespective of the interest rate. By using this method, the debtor is able to pay off the smallest loan to get early wins in the game and motivate him or her to keep going. In our example, the $1,000 debt hammer first gets applied to the $10,000 car loan. That gets paid off in a little over a year. Woohoo! So they get that early win. And then now the larger debt hammer chisels away at the $15,000 car loan and has it demolished in another year or so. Then the debt hammer tackles the credit card debt. Since minimum payments were being made for the last couple of years, it only takes a couple of months of the debt hammer for the credit card loan to be paid off. And then the debt hammer subsequently demolishes the student loans and the mortgage. Time to debt free is still nine years, but there's one more month than the avalanche. Since the highest interest rate credit card debt was sitting around longer with the snowball, interest paid in the debt snowball is about $4,000 more. But in this method, the debtors get a win at year one and year two, and then quickly demolish their credit card debt after that. That can be quite motivating and encouraging. In contrast, the avalanche didn't provide a win until over two years. But it demolishes the highest interest rate credit card debt first, thus saving the debtors some time and money. So mathematically, it makes more sense. So in our baby steps, we have already taken care of credit card debt in baby step four. The credit card debt is so high in interest that it really makes no sense to me to let that sit around. So we've already gotten rid of that in our baby steps. Now that the credit card debt is gone, all we have to do is go through the rest of the list and start working a snowball or an avalanche, whichever one you prefer. I don't include paying off the house in this step for several reasons. One is that before you do that, I want you to have a solid three to six month emergency fund in place. Also, mortgage interest is tax deductible, 
So this debt is partially subsidized by the government. So now is the time to pay off the car, any personal loans, or whatever debt you might have sitting around. This debt is a leech on your wealth building ability, so it must go. Student loans may or may not be paid off at this step. If you're trying to pay it off quickly, student loans go in this step. If you have a plan to get your student loans forgiven through PSLF or IDR, then don't pay them off here. One way that we motivated ourselves during the debt payoff process was by visually representing our debt. That really helped us stay on track monthly and stay motivated for the whole 17 months that it took to pay off my student loans. We made a jar of macaronis. Each macaroni represented $1,000. We included the projected interest we were supposed to pay in the jar, as well as the principal. Each month, when we made our extra payments, we'd take out macaronis together as a family. That helped us stay motivated and made us realize the progress we were making. Plus, that's how my kids learn how to count. Once all the debt except the house is paid off, make sure to celebrate. You have done a really important thing to improve your family's money situation, something that a lot of Americans never achieve. You are one step closer to creating your dream life, and you're on your way to financial freedom. To summarize, we have now gone through baby steps one through six. Baby step one is to protect. Get adequate insurances and estate plans set up so that those that count on you can be taken care of no matter what. Baby step two is to save up a starter emergency fund of $10,000 or the amount of the largest deductible, whichever is larger. Baby step three is to start investing at least enough to get the employer match and game plan your student loans. Baby step four is to knock out high interest debt. That's any debt over 10%. Baby step five is to start maximizing retirement investing in tax-protected accounts. We went over how to choose investments in these accounts and how to choose which accounts to invest in. Start by choosing a desired asset allocation based on your risk tolerance and then buy investments in all your accounts, keeping that allocation in mind. A simple way to do this is a lazy three-fund portfolio. That's one total domestic stock fund, one total international stock fund, and one total bond market fund. Remember to keep costs low and keep taxes in mind. Baby step six is to knock out the rest of the debts except the house and maybe accept the student loans if you're going to get forgiveness. We'll take any extra money we have left over to knock out the rest of the debt by either choosing the snowball or the avalanche method. Next week, we'll go over baby steps seven and eight, and then we'll have our financial house in order. So exciting. Thank you for listening today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you for all that you do. Now for the frugal tip of the day. If you're looking for extra money for your debt hammer, consider looking for unclaimed funds. Did you know that there are billions of dollars out there that people haven't claimed that they don't know is there? There are websites that the government has set up. It's state-based. So... If you've lived in any state, it's worth taking the time to Google, say, New York unclaimed funds. The New York Comptroller has a website where you can see if you're owed money, say, from a utility company, or you had a retirement account that you forgot about. If there's any money sitting out there that's under your name, but they can't get it to you, you can find it. Take a look. Make sure you look at every state that you've lived in. I found a few dollars here and there just because one time I had an electric company that was trying to pay me back some overage that I had paid when I moved out. Make sure you take a look at this and just see if you have any unclaimed funds sitting around. Now, a final word from our sponsor. Ready to take the first step in achieving your medical expert witness goals? Book a free 30-minute call and grow your own profitable medical expert witness practice. Visit MedicalExpertWitness.com and start making a difference in the legal field with your medical expertise today. Thank you for joining me on this journey to financial freedom. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Remember, you're not alone in this pursuit of financial freedom. Feel free to connect with me on social media, share your success stories, and keep the frugal flame burning bright. Until our next encounter, stay focused and stay frugal. See you later. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized 
financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.